Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another talk in the London Luminaries Autumn 2022 series, 14 historic properties working together to share our collective heritage. I'm Chris Harry, a volunteer at Marble Hill, but first I'd like to introduce our chair for tonight's talk, who I know will guide things most expertly, so let me introduce our own modern-day London luminary, Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you to our audience who are here watching us live. And welcome to those of you who might be joining us, stumbling across us on the interweb via our YouTube channel. This is our fourth series of London Luminaries Lectures, and our theme this time is food and drink. And our various speakers have been interpreting that theme in, in quite different ways. And I'm delighted to welcome our expert for tonight, Olivia Fryman, who's the South London Curator for Collections and Interiors at English Heritage. She spent a year working on the Marble Hill Revived project, and a highlight for her was the uh, magnificent Great Room and working out um, the history of the colour schemes of that room. Her subject for tonight is going to be set in one of the more intimate spaces at Marble Hill, where Mrs Howard would take tea. Over to you, Olivia. Thank you very much, Judith. Thank you for the lovely introduction. My talk this evening is going to be about the material culture of tea at Marble Hill, the home of the 18th century courtier Henrietta Howard in Twickenham. When Marble Hill was built in the late 1720s, tea was the most fashionable refreshment in England. But how did it gain this popularity? And what influence did tea have on the furnishing of Marble Hill? And you can see Marble Hill here in this lovely engraving after a painting by Augustine Heckel. In tonight's talk, I'm going to explore how, for Marble Hill's first owner, Henrietta Howard, taking tea was not only an important part of her daily routine, it also provided opportunities for socialising and for indulging her great passion for porcelain. This talk will trace Henrietta's collecting habits as well as the ways in which tea making permeated polite portraiture, particularly 18th century conversation pieces of families at the tea table. Before delving into tea in the 18th century, is it, it is important to recognize that tea has a far longer history than Marble Hill or Henrietta Howard. Although we think of tea as something quintessentially British, it is not British at all. And the time span of tea drinking in Britain is in fact relatively short. Tea drinking originated in China around 5,000 years ago, when according to legend, the mythical Emperor Shen Nung discovered the health-giving properties of tea while tasting plants to test their medicinal powers. Pleased with his discovery, the emperor encouraged its plantation and consumption across the land, and tea drinking became established. In early China, tea producers compressed ground tea leaves into cakes, but they were also manufactured, but they also manufactured loose leaf teas. Both were, both were ground into a powder and placed in tea bowls into which water was added and the mixture whipped with a bamboo brush to create a frothy drink. Tea was utterly unknown to Europeans until the early 17th century, when pioneering Portuguese and Dutch traders began to import both black and green tea into Europe from their trading bases in Macau. The drink slowly became established in the Netherlands and Portugal, and in 1857, the first consignments of tea reached London. The famous diarist Samuel Pepys recorded his first cup on the 20th, 25th of September, 1660, writing that he had sent for a cup of tea, a China drink of which I had never drank before. Initially, tea, along with two other new exotic beverages, chocolate and coffee, was enjoyed in coffee houses in all male places, such as coffee houses in the city. However, Charles II's Portuguese queen, Catherine of Braganza, who was accustomed to drinking tea in her homeland, also made it a court drink that was then adopted by aristocratic ladies. Tea was initially valued for its health-giving effects, just as, just as it had been in China. Thomas Garway, who wrote a lengthy description of the benefits of tea, Claim that it vanquishes heavy dreams, eases the brain and strengthens the memory. It drives away all pains and the colic proceeding from wind. 
However, having been shipped all the way from China, tea was of course extremely expensive to buy and could only be afforded by the upper classes. Tea drinking therefore quickly became a marker of wealth and status. By the 1680s, it was considered the most fashionable drink. It was, expense, it was an expensive, exotic novelty that everyone wanted to be seen enjoying. As one critical observer remarked, the great esteem of tea is chiefly for novelty's sake and because it is outlandish and dear and far-fetched and therefore admired by the multitude of ignorant people who always have the greatest esteem for things that they do not know. Henrietta Howard, who you see here pictured in this painting by Charles Jervis, was born in 1689 and was brought up in the type of wealthy family who would have had access to tea, although her fortunes were not always stable. Eventually, she became an influential courtier, patron of the arts, friend of poets and politicians, and the mistress of King George II. Although she came from a promising background, spending her early life at Blickling Hall in Norfolk, tragedy soon struck. When Henrietta was still a young girl, her father, Henry Hobart, was killed in a duel, and only a couple of years later, her mother also died. Her marriage to Charles Howard, a son of the Earl of Suffolk, only brought despair. He was violent, a gambler, a drunk, and in debt. In pursuit of a better life, Henrietta fled to seek favour with England's future monarchs at their home in Hanover, Germany. When they came to the English throne in 1714, she was given a place in the household of Caroline, the Princess of Wales, and later moved into Kensington Palace. Henrietta became known at court for her discretion and her taste. Henrietta became mistress to the, prin to the Prince of Wales, later George II. At the time, this was considered much like a court position, an essential addition to the prince's grandeur. It offered Henrietta a degree of protection from her abusive husband and some financial independence. While at court, and with a financial gift from her royal lover, Henrietta started laying foundations for a new life. With some of the age's greatest designers, such as Henry Herbert, the Ninth Earl of Pembroke, and the architects Colleen Campbell and Roger Morris, she began building Marble Hill. Around this time, she also obtained a legal separation from her abusive husband. Ten years later, in the mid-1730s, she finally left royal service and enjoyed her hard-fought her hard hard-fought new life here on the banks of the Thames. Reflecting the exclusivity of tea, it was common for wealthy families to have their portraits painted while drinking tea to show off their fashionability and sophisticated taste. These conversation pieces, as they're known, depict families elegantly seated at the tea table within a rich interior and dressed in their finest clothes. And I'd just like to show you a few examples of these paintings here. The first one you see is titled A Family of Three at Tea and was painted in around 1727 by Richard Collins. This painting here is titled A Family Being Served Tea, dates to 1745. And lastly, this painting you can see here, this actually includes Henrietta Howard herself, who you can see right in the center at the card table dressed in gold. This is a, a painting of a tea party at Lord Harrington's house in St. James's by Charles Phillips, dated 1730. And you can see on the left, the, uh, the ladies and gentlemen there are taking the tea. And actually finally here, this is Joseph Aiken's portrait of an English family at tea, dated 1720, which is in the collection at the Tate. Oops. The point of these paintings and the practice of drinking tea itself was to show off the family's expensive tea wares. During the late 17th and 18th century, the new fashion for tea drinking presented wealthy consumers with a new, with a new shopping opportunity. They now required a whole host of new equipment, a tea table, teacups and saucers, teapots and caddies, all of which had previously been unknown to Europeans. I just want to take a few minutes here to focus on these new novelties by taking a closer look at Van Aken's paintings. The most fashionable and expensive tea words were porcelain and came from China and Japan, often shipped alongside tea in cargoes from the east. Van Aken's portrait depicts a set of fashionable blue and white 
uh, china teacups and saucers that would have been similar to this example that you see here from the Chitra collection, a private collection of historic teawares in London. As tea drinking became established in England, Chinese porcelain manufacturers began to make large quantities of, te of teapots, teacups and saucers specifically for export to Europe. And just to give you a sense of the scale of this production and trade, this particular example is one of 150,000 pieces of Chinese porcelain that were part of the cargo of a Dutch merchant ship that sank in the South China Sea in 1752, and that was known as the Nanking Cargo. The wreck and the cargo were discovered in the 1980s. It is also perhaps just worth pointing out here that it is because of this trade that fine ceramics were traditionally referred to as China, because of course they originally came from China. Van Aken's painting also shows an unglazed redstoneware teapot, and that is similar to this example, also in the Chitra collection. This type of pot was made in Yuxing in China from a distinctive purple red clay called Zisha. They were considered ideal for brewing tea, as the clay is porous and absorbs the colour, smell and flavour of the tea, thus developing a seasoning after repeated use. For connoisseurs of tea drinking in England, a Yixing teapot was considered the height of sophistication. The other key object depicted in this painting is the tea caddy, you can see here at the bottom on the floor. As tea was expensive, it was kept in a lockable box, the key to which was kept by the lady of the house to protect it from pilfering servants. The caddy depicted here is a wooden box with two metal canisters inside that would have contained the tea. This example is an early silver tea canister, again from the Chitra collection. Canisters like this provided an airtight environment for the tea leaves, keeping them fresh. The lid could be used to measure out a serving of tea. And you can see here in, in Van Aken's portrait that the lady in black is, is doing that. She's measuring out um, a serving of tea into the lid of the canister. The kettle is also a key object in Van Aken's painting. Before the age of electricity, water for tea was of course boiled in a kettle heated on a stove or by an oil burner. And you can see the kettle stand in flame here. A silver kettle was a large and expensive item, and it was usually for um, and it was usual for them to be engraved with a family coat of arms, as on this example. Kettles were made with wooden handles, which didn't conduct the heat as the silver body did, um, but they were still heavy and very awkward to lift. The job of pouring the water into the teapot was usually done by a servant. And that's the case in Van Aken's painting. The lady holding the kettle here is, is clearly a servant. Later in the 18th century, kettles were replaced by urns that didn't require lifting. Instead, water could be easily poured into the teapot from a simple tap. Um, and you can see an example of an urn in this painting by Zoffany, um, and one uh, that was made by the famous silversmith Paul Storr. And the last object I want to point out here is the tea table. And what I hope you can just about see is that it's, it's black and it has um, lovely gold decoration around the edges. And this suggests that it was in fact a lacquer table, a type that would have been imported from China and Japan alongside porcelain teawares and tea itself. Lacquer wares were extremely fashionable at this time and they were often decorated with Chinese patterns and would have looked very exotic in an English house. This is a very early example of a Chinese lacquer tea table from Ham House in Richmond. And what's very interesting about it is that it's been made in two parts. The top part is the Chinese part. It's a low table that would have been used for the Chinese tea ceremony but that was performed seated on the floor. But to adapt this to Western use where chairs were of course preferred, an English carpenter has applied fashionable twisted legs to the bottom to raise the height. As tea drinking became established in England, Chinese and Japanese manufacturers of lacquer furniture began to produce tea tables especially for export to Europe that were the correct height for English use. And so that's what you can see in Van Aken's painting. Most of the objects in the painting would have been replicated in Henrietta Howard's own breakfast parlour. The tea set you can see on the table here is from the Kangxi period, so from the late 17th to early 18th century. 
and it did not belong to Henrietta, but it is typical of the type of porcelain that she would have used. An inventory of the contents of the house taken four days after Henrietta's death in 1767 lists, the great room, lists in the great room upstairs three tea boards on which there were five teapots, 10 blue china cups, and six very small cups and saucers, as well as numerous saucers, basins, and sugar dishes. There was yet more tea drinking equipment in the steward's room downstairs. A maid would have bought the boiling water in a kettle, but Henrietta, as lady of the house, would have served the tea herself. And you can see here um, on the left of the painting of Lord Harrington's house, that the lady in yellow, the lady of the house, is serving the tea. The tea leaves, either green or black, would have been stored in a flat-sided jar and carefully measured out using the pull-off cap and poured into the teapot. Once the tea had steeped, it was poured into the small handleless cups. Sugar was added using sugar nips and then milk, an addition not popular until the end of the 17th century, was added at the end. Each cup only provided a few mouthfuls of tea and then the leaves would then be discarded into the slop bowl. Unused teacups were stacked upside down and teaspoons were either rested on the shallow sources or were lent into the cup, in, in, or were lent into the cup itself. From the outset, tea was praised for its ability to foster sociability and polite conduct. When enjoyed with family and friends in the home, taking tea provided a space for generous hospitality, conversation and, a, and an elegant performance. The ceremonial way in which tea was carefully taken from the locked caddy, measured out, brewed, poured, served, and then drunk from the delicate china cups was an opportunity for the lady of the house and her guests to demonstrate their refined manners. As the poet Edward Young wrote in 1725, her two red, her two red lips affected Zephyr's blow to cool, to cool the bahia and inflame the bow while one white finger and thumb conspire to lift the cup and make the world admire. It was an also an obvious truth that when compared to wine or ale, tea was not, not intoxicating, so therefore much like, less likely to get people into trouble. Tea was widely regarded as a force for good. However, for some 18th century commentators, the tea table did represent a subversive and dangerous space. Presided over by women, often without the supervision of men, it was seen as a place of wicked idle gossip. As Henrietta's friend Jonathan Swift wrote in his Journal of a Modern Lady in 1728, when surveying the lady having her evening tea, all mad to speak and none to hearken, they set the very lapdog barking. Their chattering makes a louder din than fishwives over a cup of gin. This is also very much the message of this popular satirical print of 1720. It depicts five fashionable ladies taking tea and gossiping in a rich interior. On the table next to the tea service is a book titled Chit Chat while under the table lurks the devil and the figure of envy drives justice and truth out of the door. As with all luxur luxurious commodities, there was a perceived danger that tea drinking could lead to overindulgence and immorality. In 1713, the East India Company imported 214,000 pounds of tea by 1813, the annual import had risen 32 million pounds. The crates of tea were bulky and lightweight, but traders found the perfect ballast by incorporating another essential for the tea, tea table at the same time, and that was Chinese porcelain. The love of tea and fashion for chinoiserie were inextricably linked. Chinese porcelain not only served a practical function on the tea table, but was used to decorate the 18th century interior, whether displayed in clusters on the chimney piece, as you see here, um, as you see here, or as you see in many of Marble Hill's first floor rooms, positioned on the hearth in the summer months when the fires were lit, not lit. Henrietta Howard's 1677, 1767 inventory mentions china jars over chimneys and on top and, and on top 
and beneath lacquer cabinets. Henrietta's long lost collection of porcelain was so large that it necessitated a special china room. This room was now part of the demolished L-shaped wing that was connected to the east side of the house, just, so just outside the breakfast parlour window. The porcelain was displayed on carved shelves with gilt edges beneath a dome ceiling, probably painted by the French artist Andien de Clermont, who was known for his decorative paintings features, featuring monkeys, birds and flowers. And this is an example of Clermont, Clermont's mural painting that can be seen in the British galleries at the V&A. It's one of 16 panels that were commissioned for the Scaramouche Parlour in 1742 for Belvedere in Kent. The overall effect was described by Henrietta in a letter written to Lord Pembroke in 1739. My china room will make you stare, if not swear, though I must tell you that it is the admiration of the vulgar, but my vanity would be entirely gratified if it should meet your approbation. When the inventory was taken in 1767, the compilers were so overwhelmed by the quantity of porcelain in the china room that they simply wrote, it is not possible to count all of these things. Henrietta's friends knew of her love of porcelain. Lord Chesterfield wrote to her from The Hague in 1728, I have bought some china here, which was bought by the late East India ships that came in. It is of a very particular sort. Its greatest merit is being entirely new, which in my mind may be almost as well as being undoubtedly old. Porcelain is valued for its novelty and its connection with an ancient civilization. It was a passion shared by her friend Betty Germain and many other 18th century ladies who were following in the footsteps of Queen Mary, an extremely serious china collector who displayed her collections at Hampton Court Palace and Kensington Palace. The female love of china was satir satirized by John Gay, the playwright and one of Henrietta's friends. China's the passion of her soul, he wrote. A cup, a plate, a dish, a bowl can kindle wishes in her breast, inflame her joy, or break her rest. The appeal of porcelain was its whiteness, its translucency and brilliant colours, which was unlike anything being produced in England at this time. But it was also its exclusiveness. It was subject to heavy import duties, so only the wealthy could afford it. However, as the 18th century progressed, more and more tea was shipped to Britain from China, and in consequence, the price began to fall. Taxes were cut and tea began to descend down the social ladder. By the latter half of the 1700s, the middle and, and servant classes were able to afford tea and elegant tea sets made by the burgeoning English Staffordshire potteries. This led to increasing concern that servants were also becoming addicted to tea. Employers often gave their servants, in addition to their wages, tea and sugar allowances to prevent the temptation of stealing. The overwhelming popularity of tea also prompted English manufacturers to try and discover English porcelain, um, to, to try to discover how English porcelain was made in order to produce their own, less expensive tea services. In the 17th century, they produced tin glaze earthenware, such as Delftware, known as Delftware, in, intimidation of blue, in imitation of blue and white porcelain, but it was much coarser and creamier in colour than true porcelain. The secret of Chinese porcelain lay in the ingredients, but also having a kiln capable of firing at extremely high temperatures. The first successful commercial porcelain, commercial production of true porcelain in England was achieved by the New Hall China Manufactory in Staffordshire from 1781. And you can see one of their teapots from the collection of Marble Hill here. And this teapot dates from around 1810. The pattern is influenced by motifs found on Chinese porcelain and the knob on the top of the lid is modeled in the form of a Chinese hat. So I hope this talk has given you a sense of the significance of tea in 18th century society in the collections and interiors of Marble Hill, and its part in a much wider story, a story of trade, of cultural exchange, and cultural misunderstandings, 
of interpret entrepreneurial spirit, of changing fashions and changing notions of femininity. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand back to our chair. This is the um, penultimate lecture in what we're calling our first course of lectures. We have uh, another one next week on Turner's House. There are plenty of events going on at Marble Hill, all sorts of live events as well as online talks. And if you want to get further involved, and I, Chris can tell you about how wonderful it has been volunteering for English Heritage, do visit the English Heritage website and think about how you might support them financially. Um, you, you might donate now. Thank you so much.